please support this channel by clicking on the links below. Signs and Symbols Illustrated and Explained in a Course of 12 Lectures on Freemasonry by the Rev. George Oliver, D.D., Viker of Scotwick, Incumbent of the Collegiate Church, Wolverhampton, Provincial Deputy Grand Master for Lincolnshire, Domestic Chaplain to the Right Honorable Lord Kensington. Lecture 8 on the Masonic Ladder. Far distant, he decries, ascending by degrees magnificent, up to the wall of heaven, a structure high, at top whereof, but far more rich appeared, the work as of a kingly palace gate. The stairs were such as whereon Jacob saw angels ascending and descending. Milton. We have now contemplated the great object of our faith and hope. We have beheld the unlimited power exhibited in the expulsion of our first parents from the Garden of Eden and the subsequent destruction of the antediluvian world, events which have been uniformly grafted into all the mysteries of heathen nations. And we have considered with feelings of surprise and regret how mankind renounced the true and living God in conjunction with light and devoted themselves to imaginary deities who were worshipped in union with darkness, which elicited the vengeance of insulted purity in a series of scourges inflicted on them by war, pestilence, and famine. But in the midst of justice, he always remembered mercy. After the first great display of power in the general destruction of mankind, this gracious being placed his bow in the clouds as a divine token that mercy should now prevail and that he would no more destroy the earth by a flood of waters. And when mankind had degenerated to the lowest point of human depravity, he sent his son to make atonement for them, that lost purity might be restored, faith and hope placed on a firm foundation and its fallen creatures readmitted within the sphere of his favor and protection. Thus the dark clouds of divine wrath are dissipated, the heavens are opened, and we enjoy a ray of his glory in the celestial covering of the lodge. And more than this, the same divine being has taught us how to attain the summit of the same, by means which are emblematically depicted by a ladder consisting of three principal rounds or staves, which point to the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. We are now to consider the origin and application of this symbol, by which a communication is opened between the creature and his creator, with the gracious design of restoring to man that supreme happiness which was forfeited by Adam's transgression. The application of this emblem is said to be derived from the vision of Jacob, when the patriarch, to avoid the wrath of his brother Esau, fled to Padanaram, benighted and asleep, with the earth for his bed, a stone for his pillow, and the cloudy canopy of heaven for his covering. He beheld a ladder whose foot was placed on the spot where he lay, and its summit lost in the subtle ether. On this ladder, angels continually ascended and descended to receive communications from the Most High, who visibly appeared above the uppermost round of the ladder, and to disseminate their divine commissions over the face of the earth. Here, God graciously condescended to enter into a specific covenant with the sleeping patriarch, who was hence so impressed with the feelings of gratitude and devotion that when he awoke, he pronounced this consecrated spot the house of God and the gate of heaven. The history of an event of such importance connected with a very significant emblem, which was probably a square pyramid 
with steps on every side might with unequivocal effect be introduced by Jacob into the system of masonry which he taught to his children and from them be transplanted into the mysteries of Egypt whence it might spread into other countries until the symbol became common to the mysteries of all. I rather incline to the opinion, however, that its origin may be ascribed to a much earlier period, even to the first institution of masonry in paradise, when the communication between God and man was immediately and unrestrainedly practiced by the common parents of mankind. The ascent to the summit of the paradisiacal mount of God by means of a pyramid consisting of seven steps was an old notion, certainly entertained before the vision of Jacob, for it prevailed amongst the Mexican savages and the original settlers on the vast continent of America could have no knowledge of this vision, either by tradition or personal experience. The Jewish Kabbalists entertained a belief that the paradisiacal mount was the place of residence chosen by the children of Seth, while the contaminated descendants of Cain resided in the plains below, and its altitude was said to be so great that from its summit might be heard the angels of heaven singing their celestial anthems before the throne of God. In ancient masonry, the latter was figuratively said to rest on the Holy Bible and to consist of three principal staves, although the general number was indefinite, pointing to faith, hope, and charity as the fundamental virtues which exalt mankind from earth to heaven. But in subsequent ages, the Essenes increased the number to seven and subsequently to ten principal steps, which were denominated the Sephiroth. Footnote In the midst of a thick forest, says M. Humboldt, called Tajin, near the Gulf of Mexico, rises the pyramid of Papantla. It had seven stories, was built of hewn stone, and was very beautifully and regularly shaped. Three staircases led to the top. The covering of its steps was decorated with hieroglyphical sculpture and small niches, which were arranged with great symmetry. The number of these niches seems to allude to the 318 simple and compound signs of the days of Campo Hualitwil, or civil calendar of the Toltecs. Researches in America Volume 1, page 86, and a footnote. In the emblematical representation of these divine splendors, we find the three great hypostases of the Godhead surmounting the seven steps of the ladder, and by regular gradations ascending to the celestial abodes. The names of the seven Sephiroth were Strength, Mercy, beauty, victory or eternity, glory, the foundation, and the kingdom. Initiation was considered absolutely necessary to entitle the candidate to a participation in these divine splendors, which communicated with each other by progressive stages until, from the summit of the ladder, the three hypostases of the divine nature were attained whose consummation was a crown of glory and the throne of God. Amongst the heathen, this latter always consisted of seven steps or gradations, probably as a memorial of the seven magnificent stories of the Tower of Babel, or it might have been derived from a tradition respecting the establishment of the Sabbath in commemoration of the great day of rest which followed the creation and received the peculiar benediction of the Most High. This division of time and consecration of the seventh day was known to the sons of Noah as we may gather from our own scriptures, 
for it was practically enforced by the patriarch while he continued in the ark. Hence, the sacred nature of the seventh day was universally acknowledged by all nations of their posterity. And, consequently, many mysterious properties were ascribed to the number itself. The extreme probability that the number seven was applied to the theological ladder with this reference may be deduced from the fact that each gradation was appropriated to a day in the week and also to a particular planet and it is observable that the seven days and the seven planets were made to correspond in almost every country in the world. Footnote Acosta and Humboldt are of opinion that no nation of the new continent was acquainted with the week or cycle of seven days. But Garcilaso, Bailey, and Lalande unite in believing that the natives of America did compute their time by this cycle like the inhabitants of the old world. The Druids assigned to man seven senses. Thus, Taliesin says, quote, Of seven faculties, one is what I know by instinct. With the second, I touch. With the third, I call. With the fourth, I taste. With the fifth, I see. With the sixth, I hear. With the seventh, I smell. End of footnote. Our own names of both may be referred to as a corroboration of the system. Thus, Sunday is so called from the sun, Monday from the moon, Tuesday and Wednesday from Twisco and Woden, the Gothic Mercury and Mars, Thursday from Thor, the Jupiter of the same people, Friday from the goddess Frigga, who amongst the Gete corresponds with the Grecian Venus, and Saturday from the idol Cedar, who represented Saturn amongst the northern nations of Europe. The latter with seven steps was used in the Indian mysteries to designate the approach of the soul to perfection. The steps were usually denominated gates. The meaning is undoubtedly the same, for it is observable that Jacob in reference to the lower stave of his ladder, exclaimed, This is the house of God and the gate of heaven. Here we find the notion of ascending to heaven by means of the practice of moral virtue, depicted by the Hebrew patriarchs and by a remote idolatrous nation under the idea of a ladder, which we may hence conclude was a Masonic symbol much earlier than the time of Jacob. Footnote. There exists some degree of confusion relative to the appropriation of these days. Twisco may be more properly assimilated with the Roman Mercury and Woden with Mars. But Tertullian says that Thor was the same as Mercury and Brady tells us that the Romans dedicated Wednesday to Mercury from which cause it was called Dies Mercuri, Ferre Quarta, and the Roman Mercury and the Saxon Odin have from thence, and in despite of the Roman idol not having been a warrior, usually been regarded as the same deity. End of footnote. These gates were said to be composed of different metals of gradually increasing purity each being dignified with the name of its protecting planet. The first and lowest was composed of lead and dedicated to Saturn, the second of quicksilver, sacred to Mercury, the third of copper, under the protection of Venus, the fourth of tin, typical of Jupiter, the fifth of iron, sacred to Mars, the sixth of silver, dedicated to the moon, and the uppermost stave which constituted the summit of perfection, and opened a way to the residence of celestial deities, was composed of the pure and imperishable substance of gold, 
and was under the protection of their Most High God, the Son. In these mysteries, during the ceremony of initiation, the candidate was passed successively through seven dark and winding caverns. Footnote In every country under heaven, the initiations were performed in caverns, either natural or artificial. Several of the former are still in existence in this country. There is a remarkable one in Somersetshire called Wokey Hole, which is described as a very dark and dismal cavern consisting of various apartments, amongst which one is now called a hall, another the kitchen, others the ballroom, cellar, etc. There are also resemblances of a man's head, a monument or tombstone, a dog, the statue of a woman in white stone, called the old witch, a table, and many other artificial things in the natural rock. There are two cisterns always full of clear water, which trickles from the top of the rock, but never runs over in great quantities. A huge stone, which when lifted from and let fall to the ground, makes a noise like the report of a cannon, has for that reason got the appellation of the great gun. There are also two rivulets, abounding in trout and eels, which run through this cave, making a tremendous noise. One of them turns several mills after it is out. The inside of this cave is rocky and uneven, the surface ascending and descending, as is the case in most other subterraneous places. It is in some places, eight fathoms or 48 feet high, and in others, not above six. Its length is computed to be about 640 feet. In some parts, the water dropping from the rock hangs down like icicles, which has a very beautiful effect. The rock inside is of different colors, being in some parts of a silvery hue, while in others, it glitters like diamonds. End of footnote. In these mysteries, during the ceremony of initiation, the candidate was passed successively through seven dark and winding caverns, which progress was mystically denominated, the ascent of the ladder. Each cavern terminated in a narrow stone orifice, which formed an entrance to its successor. Through these gates of purification, the mortified aspirant was compelled to squeeze his body with considerable labor, and when he had attained the summit, he was said to have passed through the transmigration of the spheres, to have accomplished the ascent of the soul, and to merit the favor of the celestial deities. These seven stages of initiation, emblematical of the seven worlds, are thus explained. The place where all beings, whether fixed or movable, exist is called earth, which is the first world. That in which beings exist a second time, but without sensation, again to become sensible at the close of the period appointed for the duration of the present universe, is the world of re-existence. The abode of the good, where cold, heat, and light are perpetually produced, is named heaven. The intermediate region, between upper and lower worlds, is denominated the middle world. The heaven, where animals, destroyed in a general conflagration at the close of the appointed period, are born again, is thence called the world of birth. That in which Seneca and other sons of Brahma, justified by austere devotion, reside exempt from all dominion, is thence named the mansion of the blessed, truth, the seventh world, and the abode of Brahma, is placed on the summit above other worlds. Footnote. This being was identified with light, for the Brahmins say, because the being who shines with seven rays, assuming the forms of time and fire, matures productions, is resplendent, 
illuminates, and finally destroys the universe. Therefore, he who naturally shines with seven rays is called light, or the effulgent power. Thus, Brahm is light, and light is the principle of life in every created thing. Light and darkness are esteemed the world's eternal ways. He who walketh in the former path returneth not, i.e., he goeth immediately to bliss, whilst he who walketh in the latter cometh back again upon the earth, or is subjected to further tedious transmigrations. End of footnote. It is attained by true knowledge, by the regular discharge of duties, and by veracity. Once attained, it is never lost. Truth is indeed the seventh world, therefore called the sublime abode. In the Persian mysteries, the candidate, by a similar process, was passed through seven spacious caverns, connected by winding passages, each opening with a narrow portal, and each the scene of some perilous adventure to try his courage and fortitude before he was admitted into the splendid Sicilum which being illuminated with a thousand torches reflected every shade of color from rich gems and amulets with which the walls were copiously bedecked. The dangerous progress was denominated ascending the ladder of perfection. From this doctrine has arisen the tale of Rustam, who was the Persian Hercules, and Dive Sepet, or the White Giant. Kaikos, the successor of Kai Kobab, the first monarch of the Canaanian dynasty, is instigated by the song of a minstrel to attempt the conquest of Mazendurium, which is celebrated as a perfect earthly paradise. This celestial abode refers to the splendid Sicilum of the Persian Epopte which was an emblematical representation of heaven. It lies in the regions of Asprus, at the foot of which, with respect to Persia, the sun sets, and in literal geography, it is determined to be a province bordering on the Caspian Sea. Hence, it is part of that high tract of country denominated the Tabaric or Gordian Range, within the limits of which the groves of Eden were planted and the ark rested after the deluge. Kaikos fails in his enterprise, for the sacred country is guarded by the white giant, who smites him and all his troops with blindness and makes them his prisoners. This is a literal account of the first stage of initiation, which in the mysteries always commenced with darkness. In those of Britain, the candidate is designated as a blind man. He is commanded to prepare the cauldron of Serdwin, three drops of whose contents, properly concocted, were said to possess the faculty of restoring the sight and infusing a knowledge of futurity. Being unsuccessful, Serdwin, the giantess, strikes the unfortunate aspirant a violent blow over his head with an oar and causes one of his eyeballs to fall from the socket. And the captivity of Caicus and his Persians in the cavern under the rigid guardianship of the dive is but a figurative representation of the candidate's enclosure under the pastos and this place of penance in the Celtic mysteries which had many ceremonies in common with those of Persia, was said to be guarded by the gigantic deity Banwar, armed with a drawn sword who was represented as a most powerful and vindictive being capable in his fury of making heaven, earth, and hell to tremble. In the Gothic mysteries, the same place of captivity and penance is fabled to be guarded by Heimdall, whose trumpet emits so loud a blast that the sound is heard through all the worlds. In this emergency, the king sends a messenger to Zal, the father of the hero Rustam, begging his immediate assistance. For the greater dispatch, Rustam takes the shorter, 
though more dangerous road and departs alone, mounted on his charger, Rakesh. Here, Rustam enters upon the dreadful and dangerous business of initiation, mounted, says the legend, upon the charger Rakesh, or more properly, Rakishi. This was a horrible winged animal, whose common food is said to have been serpents and dragons. Now these reptiles, together with monsters compounded of two or more animals, were the ordinary machinery used in the mysteries to prove the courage and fortitude of the aspirant during his progress through the seven stages of regeneration. The course which he chooses is styled the road of the seven stages and at each of the first six he meets with a different adventure by which his persevering courage is severely tried. At each of the seven stages the candidate really encountered many dangers and vanquished a multitude of dives, dragons, and enchanters who in succession opposed his progress to perfection. Being pantomimically enacted during the process of initiation and the reiterated attacks prosecuted with unrelenting severity, instances have occurred where the poor affrighted wretch has absolutely expired through excess of fear. Having at length, however, fought his way to the seventh, he discovers his prince and the captive Persians when he learns from the Kaikos that nothing will restore his sight but the application of three drops of blood from the heart of the white giant. The symbolical three drops of blood had its counterpart in all the mysteries of the ancient world, for the number three was ineffable and the conservator of many virtues. In Britain, the emblem was three drops of water. In Mexico, as in this legend, three drops of blood. In India, it was a belt composed of three triple threads. In China, the three strokes of the letter Y. Upon this, he attacks his formidable enemy in the cavern, where he was accustomed to dwell, and having torn out his heart, after an obstinate combat, he infuses the prescribed three drops into the eyes of Kaikos, who immediately regains his powers of vision. In this tale, we have the theological ladder connected with the system of Persian initiation transferred from mythology to romance, and the coincidence is sufficiently striking to impress the most ordinary observer with the strict propriety of the application. The candidate comes off conqueror and is regularly restored to light, after having given full proof of his courage and fortitude by surmounting all opposing dangers. Father Angelo, who went out as a missionary into the east about 1663, says that in the midst of a vast plain between Shiraz and Schuster, he saw a quadrangular monument of stupendous size, which was said to have been erected in memory of this great enterprise of the hero Rustam. The fact is that this quadrangular enclosure was an ancient place of initiation, and from a confused remembrance of the scenes of mimic adventure which were represented within its seven secret caverns, the fabulous labors of Rustam had doubtless their origin. It is not the least singular part of this enquiry that the followers of Muhammad still use the same form of expression to convey an idea of the progressive state of torment in the infernal regions. This is only a continuation of the doctrine of the mysteries which taught that the initiation of candidates was in reality a representation of the descent of the soul into Hades and of its passage through the seven stages of purification preparatory to its admission into the abode of light and purity. They say that hell has seven gates, each containing a different degree of punishment. The first and least severe they call Jehenim, which is prepared for all Muslims who are sinners. The second, called Lada, is for the Christians. The third is the Jewish hell and called Hothama. Sa'ir, the fourth, is for Sabians, and Sakar, the fifth, for magicians. 
Pagans and idolaters occupy the sixth, which they call Gehim, and the lowest and most horrible depth of hell they assign to hypocrites, who pretend to more religion than their neighbors and set themselves up as patterns of perfection, while inwardly they are full of all kinds of wickedness and impiety. This dreadful gate, or place of eternal punishment, is called Halviath. You will much wonder at these very extraordinary coincidences, which are exceedingly valuable because undesigned and render the conjecture highly probable that they were put in imitation of the Masonic ladder, as used in our science before the mysteries had a being. But I have yet to introduce to your notice a coincidence still more remarkable, because proceeding from a country where such a tradition could scarcely be expected to exist. Yet it is no less true that distinct traces of this latter, attended by the very same references, are found in the inhospitable regions of Scandinavia, which have been indubitably preserved in the Gothic mysteries, though the application is somewhat more obscure. The court of the gods, says the Edda, is ordinarily kept under a great ash tree called Yggdrasil, where they distribute justice. This ash is the greatest of all trees. Its branches cover the surface of the earth. Its top reaches to the highest heavens, and it is supported by three vast roots, one of which extends to the ninth world, or hell. An eagle whose piercing eye discovers all things perches upon its uppermost branches. A squirrel is continually running up and down to bring news, while a parcel of serpents fastened to the trunk endeavor to destroy him. The serpent, Nidhogger, continuously gnaws at its root. From under one of the roots runs a fountain, wherein wisdom lies concealed. From a neighboring spring, the fountain of past things, Three virgins are continuously drawing a precious water with which they irrigate the ash tree. This water keeps up the beauty of its foliage and after having refreshed its leaves falls back again to the earth where it forms the dew of which the bees make their honey. Mr. Mallet offers no conjecture on this mysterious tree and Mr. Cottle fairly gives it up. I pronounce it, however, to have been the theological ladder of the Gothic mysteries. Mr. Cottle, in the preface to his interesting version of the Edda of Samund, says, The symbolical purport of this tree is inexplicable amidst the dearth of information respecting the ancient religion of Scandinavia, and without a reference to the various systems of initiation into the religious mysteries of other nations, I should incline to that gentleman's opinion. But by comparing the qualities and characteristics of this sacred tree with the ladder of the mysteries, the difficulty vanishes, and the solution appears at once simple and natural. The basis of Yggdrasil, like that of Jacob's ladder, was the earth, where it was firmly established by three vast roots, one of which extended to the central abyss. These roots evidently referred to the three lower gates, or chambers of initiation, the last of which was Hades, or the region of the dead. Its branches covered the earth and its top reached to the heavens, where sat enthroned an eagle, the representative of the supreme god. The court of the inferior gods was said to be under this tree, and Jacob said of the place where the foot of his ladder was situated, this is the house of God and the gate of heaven. On its summit sat the emblematical eagle as Jehovah appeared on the ladder of Jacob or on the paradisiacal mountain. And this bird, as we have already seen, was actually a component part of the visible symbol of the true God as exhibited in the Jewish cherubim and the universal representation of the deity in almost every nation under heaven. A squirrel or a messenger continually ascended and descended to carry celestial commissions from the eagle deity, 
to the council of inferior gods seated below, whence they were supposed to be disseminated over the face of the earth. And the same subordinate deities were said to take cognizance of the actions of mortals and to convey an impartial account thereof by the squirrel to the deity seated on the summit of the tree, which was also the office of the angelic messengers on Jacob's ladder. A parcel of serpents, symbols of the evil power, unceasingly endeavored to intercept the communication between God and man by the destruction of the messenger. The monstrous serpent, Nidhagger, who is the representation of the prince of darkness himself, we are further told, continuously gnaws its root for the same purpose, willing to sever the connection between the creator and his fallen creatures by the total demolition of the medium through which the benevolent communication is carried on. In the Hindu mythology, the prince of the evil demons is represented as a large serpent whose name is Naga. And the Hebrew name for the tempter of Eve in paradise, translated in our version of the Bible, the serpent was Nakash. These were both the Nidhagger of the Gothic mysteries. In the Essenian mysteries, the Holy Bible was figuratively said to be the consecrated foundation of Jacob's ladder. Because the covenants and promises of God are permanently recorded in that sacred book, and this basis, the old serpent who deceived Eve is continuously endeavoring to destroy by subverting the faith of mankind and its contents. The three roots are emblems of faith, hope, and charity, because it is by the exercise of these virtues alone that man can enjoy a well-grounded expectation of ascending from earth to heaven. Three virgins, symbols of past, present, and future, continuously watered this tree from the fountain of past things, which is expressive of that solemn truth that the deeds of men shall be kept in perpetual remembrance until the last day when they shall be rewarded or punished according to their works. From the surplus of this water which fell to the earth after having refreshed the leaves of the ash, the bees made their honey. In all the ancient mysteries, honey was an acknowledged symbol of death and is said in this case to have been produced from the refuse of the water, which being rejected by the sacred tree, referred unquestionably to the evil deeds contained in the water of past things, the good actions having been absorbed by the ash and consequently accepted by the supreme being, personified in the eagle. And hence, the honey which was concocted from it was emblematical of that second death which forms the eternal punishment of sin. In illustration of the contents of this lecture, I here introduce the following table which will exhibit the seven-step ladder of the mysteries in all its various and extensive application. You have here a most extraordinary coincidence of custom with respect to the Masonic ladder existing in every region of the world and all equally applicable to a gradual ascent to heaven by the practice of moral virtue. Amongst us, this practice is founded on the strong basis of faith, which is the first step of the ladder resting on the word of God. It produces a well-grounded hope of sharing the promises recorded in that sacred volume. And this is the second step of the Masonic ladder. The third or more perfect step is charity by which we attain the summit of the ladder, metaphorically speaking, the dominion of bliss and the mansion of pure and permanent delight. End of Lecture 8 Please support this channel by clicking on the links below.